We're going to read our passage for this morning, which is in Matthew 6, starting in verse 9 through to 13. Therefore, you should pray like this. Our Father in heaven, your name be honoured as holy. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Praise God. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessing of your body, your church. We can come here on a Sunday in this wonderful room. We can enjoy each other's company. But more importantly, we can come to worship and honour you and hear again from your word. And so I pray that I would be a good communicator, but I pray that all of us would be good listeners. We do ask that our ears would be open in a physical sense, but also our hearts would be open in a spiritual sense. And that, Lord, you would open our hearts to hear again from your word and that you may change us and transform us through it. I ask that I would decrease, you would increase. And we pray this in your son's name, the Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, this morning, I want to start off with a story from World War II about a man named Helmut Thielicker. Okay, Helmut was a German Protestant theologian and minister who ministered in a town called Stuttgart during the war. Helmut was no lover of Hitler and no lover of the Nazi regime, but he was a lover of God and he was a lover of God's people. During the war, Stuttgart experienced intense damage through aerial bombings, and most of this happening, or the largest of this occurring in 1944, right near the the end of World War II. Well, one Sunday morning after these bombings, Helmut took his post in his pulpit to address his congregation, as he had done the Sunday before. The walls of his church, they no longer stood as strong, fortifying walls, and no longer did that. They were now broken down. They could no longer house people safely from the effects of war. They had experienced what it's like to live and exist in a broken world. The people of his church who only years before sat happily with their families, like many of us do today, side by side, they no longer did. Children sat as orphans, wives sat as widows, heartbroken husbands sat without hope. They too had experienced the effects of a broken world. And so Helmut stood there with his old army boots strapped to his feet, no longer possessing the gowns that he once wore to address his congregation. And approaching his pulpit, he turned to the very text that we turned to this morning. He turned to the very text that we turned to this morning to encourage his congregation. And he said this. He said, in this world of death, in this empire of ruins and shell-torn fields, we pray, thy kingdom come. And now we pray it more fervently than ever. We pray, thy kingdom come. See, Helmut knew that progress in this world, in this world filled with such hate and violence against God, that the only way of progress would be Christ and his kingdom. I start with a story like that for two reasons. Firstly, because it's a humbling reminder that sometimes the trials that you and I face are just a slither, a slither of the real darkness that actually exists in this world. And that perspective is sometimes very helpful to hear. But secondly, to the point of our passage, I share this story because it's a tangible reason for our very real need to pray for God's kingdom to come. See, Helmut and his congregation at Stuttgart, they understood that the God-hating darkness that spews forth from the kingdoms of this world, it will not be overcome by mere charity or goodwill. The kingdom of this world must be conquered. It must be conquered by the kingdom of light himself and the king of light himself. They understood that the pride, the anger, the violence, jealousy, lust, greed that arise from our sinful passions and the sinful wills of mankind will not be overcome by mere behaviour modification. They must be conquered by a greater will. They must be conquered with someone with a greater determination to make things right, greater than you and I. They must be conquered by God himself. And that really brings us to the heart cry of the prayer for God's kingdom and God's will. That's the big idea for our sermon this morning. That is, when we pray, your kingdom come and your will be done, we are asking God to conquer. Conquer broken kingdoms of this world and broken wills of this world. And that includes our own. That includes our own. And that really just might be the most confronting part about this petition. 
See, when we pray that God's kingdom would come and God's will be done, we just can't think of the kingdoms out there. We can't think of the wills of our next door neighbours. We must also look inwardly, considering our own little kingdoms and our own little wills. When we pray that God's kingdom would come and God's will be done, we immediately forfeit the right to our own kingdoms and our own plans. To use the language of war, it's as if we pray the prayer, we throw up the flag. The white flag gets raised and we say, we surrender. God, it's your kingdom and your will. That's my hope as we progress through this sermon, that we'll actually be more eager to pray this on a daily basis. But not only that, we'd be more eagerly to live it out on a daily basis, living for his kingdom. Now, as we proceed, we're going to take three steps. And as you've noticed, I'm a sweater. Okay? Proceed, we're going to take these three steps. Firstly, we're going to spend a considerable amount of time unpacking the petition of this request. We're going to ask the question, what does it mean by God's kingdom? Or what does God's kingdom mean? We're going to look at this. After we do that, we're going to look at how we now pray for the kingdom in light of that answer. And then as we close, I'm going to briefly tell you why as disciples we must be committed to praying for God's kingdom daily. Okay? In short, that's the what, the how, the why. What is the kingdom? How do we pray for it? And why should we do it? Let's begin by looking at the kingdom of God. Over centuries of the church, Christians from every creed and every confession have been concerned about the kingdom of God. And that's rightly so. See, it's a major theme throughout the New Testament, mentioned over 120 times in the Gospels alone, 30 times throughout the other New Testament letters. And although we don't see the words, the kingdom of God in the Old Testament, the concept of the kingdom of God is deeply rooted in its theology. From the early pages of Genesis, we see God pictured as a king who rules over his creation to some of the final words of the prophets as they ached, as they waited for the king who would come and bring the kingdom of God to make things right. And so it's no surprise that when that king actually does come, Jesus, in the earliest stages of his ministries, he is about the kingdom of God. We see this after John the Baptist was arrested. We see Jesus in Mark 1.15. He says, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. It would be this proclamation, the proclamation of God's kingdom, that would continue to drive the ministry of Jesus here on earth. It would be the engine room of his actions, It would be the force that propelled him from town to town. And we see this in passages like Luke 4. In Luke 4, Jesus is in Capernaum in Galilee. He's teaching in the synagogues. He's he's healing people. He's doing all these wonderful things. And then we read this in verse 42 and 43. And the people came to him. This is the people of Galilee. They tried to prevent him from leaving. And Jesus said to them, It's necessary for me to proclaim the good news about the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because this is why I was sent, or this is the purpose why I was sent. Jesus was so much about the kingdom of God that when it came time to send out his disciples to spread the word, what was the word they were to spread? Jesus said, tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. Read this in Luke 10. Just over a quarter of the parables spoken by Jesus are about the kingdom of God. In fact, Jesus and his ministry became so synonymous with the kingdom of God that even a thief who hung on a cross for mere hours next to Jesus was able to recognize him for who he truly was, the king the king of the kingdom. Jesus was so fixated with the kingdom of God that even after his death, after his resurrection, what do we see him talking about with his disciples? Acts 1-3, the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God was the passion that drove ministry of Christ to the cross and it was the purpose and why he rose from the grave to the throne. From cross to crown was all about the kingdom. And now I'm sure some of you have probably caught on. Yep. That's great, Jason. You're telling us that Jesus is all about the kingdom. We know that. We come to church. That would be true. So let's spend a few moments talking about what is the kingdom. So what is the kingdom of God and why was Jesus constantly talking about it? Over the years, there's been many pages written by many men with much bigger minds than I have, and so we could be here all day. However, for the sake of the sermon and our series on prayer, I want us to consider the kingdom of God under three headings. And then as we move to our next point, what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to backtrack on these three headings and then let us consider how we pray for the kingdom of God in light of these three things. Okay, the first one I want us to see is this, is the scope of the kingdom of God, and that relates to this, his cosmic and personal reign. So the scope of the kingdom of God is his cosmic and personal reign. For those who might just be listening to the sermon, I don't mean reign that falls from the sky, I mean reign is in rulership, Okay. God reigns and rules over his 
creation as the cosmic creator. And so in this sense, God's kingdom extends across all creation because God rules and reigns over all of it. We consider verses like Psalm 103, verse 19. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. His kingdom rules over all. There's no mincing of words here. As the creator, God has supreme ownership over all things and nothing else is outside of his rule and his authority. He is the cosmic king and his kingdom extends across the visible and invisible world. However, when we narrow in on the life and ministry of Jesus, we see him time and time again shining a spotlight, not so much on the cosmic reign of God, but on the personal reign of God in the lives of individuals. What do I mean by that? See, when Jesus comes proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, he has an expectation. His expectation is that this good news will actually affect the people who hear it. And so in this sense, the kingdom of God exists anywhere that God is acknowledged as king. And it happens at a personal level in our hearts and in our lives. And a helpful way of thinking of this is we could consider God's cosmic reign as the forest filled with trees and God's personal reign as an individual tree in which God cares for, nurtures and rules over in a special way. And look at me again with Mark 1.14. It says, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. You know, Jesus says three things in this short few sentences. Firstly, that the wait is over. Hallelujah. Secondly, that the kingdom of God is good news. Second, hallelujah. And lastly, that the appropriate response to this good news is to repent and believe. Jesus says, I've come with the good news of the kingdom. And if believed and if followed, this kingdom will change your life. And that's exactly what we see across the pages of the New Testament. And that's exactly what many of us have experienced in our own lives. The good news of the kingdom, when heard and obeyed, can transfer people from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. It's in Colossians 1. It has the power to transform sin-sick slaves of wickedness to spirit-empowered slaves of righteousness. Romans 6. So potent, so powerful is the good news of this kingdom that it takes spiritually dead people, those who were once considered children deserving of wrath, and rightly so, and makes them alive in Christ. Ephesians 2. And so wherever we see these things present, we know that God's kingdom is present. So that's the first one. When we think of God's kingdom, we should acknowledge his cosmic reign, but we should also think about how he reigns in our lives and the lives of those we know and love in their hearts and how they live out. Okay? The second one. Scribes, the second thing I want to see is the timing of the kingdom. That is, it's already here, but it's still coming. Or as some say, it's, it's here, but it's not yet, which is a bit of a silly way to say it, but there is no really other way to say it. All right, Matthew 12 shows us this. Jesus explains to not some, some not-so-wise Pharisees that he doesn't cast out demons by the power of demons. That's silly. He casts out demons by the power of the Spirit of God. And he tells them this in verse 28. He says, If I drive out demons by the Spirit of God, which he did, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. It's here. The kingdom of God is here. Again, another time in Luke 17, some not-so-wise Pharisees they were completely confused about why Jesus did the things he did, how he did them, and why he said the things he said. And then in verse 20, we see them ask Jesus again when the kingdom of God would come. And Jesus answered them, well, the kingdom of God is not coming with something observable, referring to the kingdom that they were expecting. No one will say, see there or see here. Well, there it is. For you see that the kingdom of God is in your midst. What's his point? Well, the Pharisees, they were looking off into the distance, waiting for a coming kingdom, but Jesus told them, it's already come. How has it come? You're looking at it. If you see me, you see the king. If you see the king, you see the kingdom. Jesus was clear. I have come, and because I have come, so has the kingdom of God. And so in this sense, the kingdom of God really is here. It exists here amidst us. But then on the other hand, Jesus speaks of a kingdom which is still to come, a kingdom that has not yet fully arrived. We see this in passages like Matthew 25 and verse 31. He says there, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, referring to a time in the future, then he will sit on his glorious throne, and all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate one from the other, just as a shepherd separates sheep from goats. He will put the sheep on his right, the goats on his left. And then the king will say to those who are on his right, Come, 
You who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Jesus here is not referring to his first coming. That's clear. There was a coming in humility, one in which he set aside his glory. But he speaks of his second coming. A coming in which he comes in his glory. A time when a great judgment will occur and the kingdom of God will be fully realised. And no longer will God rule over a rebellious world, one under the influence of evil powers and spiritual forces, like we see in Ephesians 2 and 6. But at that time, the broken kingdom of this world will be done away with fully. And the kingdom of this world will become the kingdom of our Lord and his King, the Lord Jesus Christ. Revelation 11. At that time, corruptible will be taken over by incorruptible. The mortal will be clothed by immortality. Death itself will be swallowed up in victory. 1 Corinthians 15. It's a glorious time that we should look forward to, and we'll see later how we pray forward to. So we've considered the scope of the kingdom, the timing of the kingdom. Let's consider very briefly the mission of the kingdom. The kingdom of God is about reconciliation. When Jesus walked the earth, he told us very clearly that his message would bring a sword. It would divide fathers from sons and mothers from daughters and so on. And the division that Jesus was talking about was a division based on what people thought about him. It would expose those who hated God. It would identify those who welcomed God and loved his king. And the message of Christ exposed back then, and it continues to expose, a division that exists between believers and unbelievers. However, it can be very easy to get caught up on that. It would be very easy to think about the divisions that exist between unbelievers and believers and forget the mission of the kingdom. So we must remember that the mission of Christ was to bring about a radical reconciliation unlike any other. Unlike any other. Now to be reconciled means to be in right relationship with. And the reconciliation that comes from God and this good news of the kingdom comes to us on two fronts. First, between God and man, but also between us, between believers. And we celebrated that again this morning as we came around the Lord's table. Romans 5.10 tells us this. For if while we were enemies of God, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, we will be saved by his life. Now this reconciliation should not only bring about great joy and thankfulness in our hearts, but it also should have a radical effect on how we live our lives here on earth. It should change us, not just us personally, but how we now live. And this is what we see in the life of Paul. He writes this in 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5. He says, because he's been reconciled to God, he says, we are therefore ambassadors of Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And Paul reminds us, as those who have been reconciled, As those who have been reconciled, we are now ambassadors of that reconciliation, of Christ and his kingdom, of his holy nation, of his people. And what's our message? Be reconciled to God. How is this possible? Well, Christ has done it all. Fantastic news. Christ has done it all. The consequence that you deserve for your sin, we're placed on him. And he gives you his righteousness. In doing so, he brings you back into a right relationship to God. It's one of those truths that I pray that I would never forget and that you would never forget also. The good news of the kingdom is that man can be reconciled to God. But it goes beyond that, as I said. It's not just about reconciling men to God or women to God so they can remain individuals. The kingdom of God isn't like public transport where 30 or 40 individuals cram onto a train or a bus and they stare at their phone for 35 minutes. The kingdom is not to be like that. Not to be like that at all. See, when God reconciles individuals to himself, he reconciles them into one body in Christ. He makes them members immediately with the body of Christ, each and every person having a place. They become like living stones being built up by other living stones into a spiritual house. They become like sheep amongst the great flock of Christ. And they become like spiritual fathers, spiritual mothers, Spiritual brothers, spiritual sisters in this grace, great house or grace, look at that, great household of faith. This is what God does when He reconciles us. It's not just about you and God, it's about you and each other. The reconciliation that you and I have through the Lord Jesus is to be displayed and expressed about is with how we care and are reconciled with one another. 
The mission of the kingdom of God is to reconcile God to man, but also mankind to each other. As he does so, the world watches on and they wonder, what on earth is God doing? Oh, he's building a kingdom. You can just tell them that. So that gives us a bit of a framework, a bit of a framework of how we should think about the kingdom of God and what does it mean. Now, as I said, I'm actually going to cycle back now and you're going to hear some of the same things, but I want us to think about now how we pray for these things. It would be an easy thing just to stand up here and say, pray for God's kingdom to come, and you walk out and go, well, I don't even know what that means. And so there we go. That's what it means. Now let's think about how we pray for it. All right, let's look at this first one. First thing we see that when we pray for God's kingdom to come and God's will to be done, we are wanting to consider or acknowledge God's cosmic reign first. When we do this, we acknowledge his cosmic reign. And to some degree, this is what we've done in the model of the Lord's Prayer. It's already been done. In addressing God as our Holy Father in heaven, we have declared his cosmic reign and his ultimate authority over all things. We have declared that he is unmatched in his perfections and he is transcendent in his being. We are declaring with David in Psalm 24 verse 1 that the earth is the Lord, the world and all its inhabitants, they belong to the Lord. And we're just asking that God would act according to that power, that he would show his great power as the all-sovereign cosmic king. So we pray that your kingdom come and your will be done as first an acknowledgement of God and his cosmic reign. In saying that you are king, we are saying that you are supreme commander over all things and we acknowledge that you should act according to your desire. But it goes beyond that. As followers, we want him to rule and reign at a personal level, not only in our lives, but in the lives of those we know and love, in our friends and our families. And so that should both shape who we pray for and what we pray for. Let's consider briefly the who and then let's consider the what. And when we think of the who, we, if we're honest, the list of prayer could be quite large. But sometimes it can be overwhelming. Instead of praying for people on an individual basis, what we end up doing is we just shoot up a prayer and say, Lord, help everyone I know. That was a good prayer time. Thank you very much. And sometimes that's going to be the way we do pray. I remember last year we actually worked through a bunch of persecuted churches uh, as a church, we had a little booklet that we went through and family devotions each night, we'd be praying for a country and the prayers quickly became, at least from our children, the prayers quickly became, Lord, help everyone in Nigeria. Save them all. And it's, yeah, you know, that's, I wish I had that much faith, but it's one of those things. Our prayers become so kind of across the board, just large, and there's nothing wrong with that. But there are times when we do want to stop, we want to slow down and think about who we are praying for. Okay, so as a guide, I think a helpful way to do this is to create a list of people and I call it this core to store list. I create a list of people. Those on the core list are those closest to you, those who make up the core of your life, your family, your friends, your church members, uh, those who you're in contact with at work every day. Uh, these are the people who you are most in contact with. And by store list, I mean those who are now separated from you, those who are at a distance. They may be people who you actually meet at the local store. Someone on my store list is the local Caltex guy who I get coffees on. Yeah. I see him twice a week. He's on my prayer list for my store list. I pray for him. I talk to him. I ask that the Lord would help us engage on spiritual matters. He's on my store list. They're distant family members, people in our communities, our schools, our governments, and so on. And so over the space of a week or a month, you could set up a list in which you pray each day, starting with the core and moving to the store. That's the who. What about the what? What do we pray for them? Well, that's quite simple. We pray that God would rule. We pray that God would rule in their hearts and in their lives. And we think of this core and store list, one thing to start with, as our big idea has already suggested, when you start with your core list, you start with the core of your core. That's, that's you. Remembering that when we pray for God's kingdom to come and God's will be done, we're not asking him just to conquer the broken kingdoms and worlds out there. We're asking him to conquer our broken kingdoms and worlds. So it starts with confession of sin. It starts by acknowledging wrong before our king. It continues by asking him to break down the idols that we've formed in our own heart, removing the false kings which stand in place of our true king. And then we might pray for our friends and our family in these same manners. If we start our prayer in this way, we know as Christians we can take a leaf out of Paul's prayers in the New Testament. We think of his prayer in Ephesians 1. He says this, I pray, this is speaking to the Ephesians, I pray that the eyes of your hearts may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what is the wealth of his glory and inheritance for the, for the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness and power towards us who believe according to the mighty working of his strength? Fantastic prayer. I mentioned it in the first service and I've mentioned it at every church that I've gone to. 
I will give you permission to pray that for me daily. <laughs> and I pray that you would pray it for each other daily. After praying for those who are Christians, you might then pray for those who are non-Christians in your life. You could pray this. Lord, you know the hearts and minds of people, of all people. And we ask that your spirit would be at work through your word, convicting James, Michelle, Frank, Betty. You enter a name. May they know the depths of their sin and their need for forgiveness. May you be gracious to them as you have been gracious to me. May you work in their heart as you have worked in mine, and may you be their king as you are my king. So when we consider Christ's command to pray for God's kingdom, our prayer should affect the way we pray for people. No longer will our greatest concerns in prayer be about bunions and back pains. Right? Rather, our greatest concerns in prayer will be that God would be worshipped as supreme and the sufficient one that all people need. That is their greatest need. And so whenever we pray our prayers and they reflect God's desires and God's commands, we know that we are praying your kingdom come. Okay? Let's consider the next one. Already here but still coming. Our theology and our own experience tells us that life in a fallen world has big problems. And some of these problems, some of the evils that this world has, will not meet their end until the kingdom of God arrives in full. And so at the second coming of Christ, the effects of sin will be dealt, dealt with in one final swipe of the Lord's justice. And so as Christians who see the evils of this world, we're encouraged to pray to that end. We think of Paul's very short prayer in 1 Corinthians 16. He says, our Lord, come. We think of the prayer at the end of the book of Revelation. Come, Lord Jesus, come. In fact, this request became something of so common of prayer in the early church, becoming part of their weekly gatherings. We see this in the early instruction manuals of the church. After the Lord's Supper, the congregation would be encouraged to give thanks, and they would say something like this. Let grace come and let this world pass away. Hosanna to the God of David. If anyone is holy, let him come. If anyone is not so, let him repent. Our Lord, come. Amen. Why? Why pray like this? Because we know that when Jesus returns, he brings the kingdom of God in full. And then the evil and the suffering of this world will be no longer... Well, the dominions and authorities in this world will be put under his feet. Death, darkness, evil, suffering will be done away with. And so that's a good thing to pray for. It's a very good thing to pray for. But our prayer for the kingdom should also be extended to God's continual work here on earth. That the kingdom of God would continue to grow here on earth. And so we pray for the church. We pray for the church on the local level, on the international level. We ask that God would strengthen churches in Brisbane and Logan and beyond. We pray for our nation, the churches across our nation, the churches across the world. We pray that the kingdom of God would be expressed in our lives at work, at school and at university, that we as ambassadors would live by kingdom ethics and that God would help us to do so wherever we find ourselves. We can pray that the kingdom of God would be expressed in our families as little kingdoms living under the great king that we would have rules and commands in our house which reflect his gracious rules and commands in our life. And so when we pray for his kingdom to come, we pray for the consummation of his kingdom. But we also pray for the continual establishment of his kingdom here on earth in the hearts and lives of God's people. Let's press on, consider how it is we pray for God's mission. Well, I've already said that as we pray, we should be praying for non-Christians. We should be praying that they would see Jesus as he truly is, that he would open the eyes of their hearts that they would know who he is. We should pray for them to be reconciled to him or to God through him. But further than that, we should take our role seriously as ambassadors, as disciples makers, as those who teach and tell people how to be reconciled to God. But further to this, as we think and we take the mission of God seriously of reconciliation, when we take our relationships with each other seriously as we have been reconciled. Now, there are many ways we, which we do this. We're caring and loving for one another. But since we're on the topic of prayer, I think it's good to talk about prayer. One of the ways that we could do this is actually asking each other how we can pray for each other. And believe it or not, then actually doing it. Actually praying for the people that you've asked to pray for. Not talking about those prayer points to others. That's called gossip. But bringing them before your Father in heaven, one who knows and can meet their needs. Over the years, I've found it quite helpful to, at the start of the week, I just messaged a couple of people, hey, how can I be praying for you this week? And by the end of the week, I touch base with them, how has the Lord been working in your life this week? Or on Sunday, 
How's the Lord been working on your life this week? And when they turn around, they say, oh, look, no changes. I say, okay, well, I'll keep praying and maybe you'll see them. God's always at work, okay? These these things. This is one way that I help foster the love that we have in the body of Christ. It shows people that you just aren't someone who sits across side from me at church on Sunday. You aren't just another person who stands and sings those songs. No, but rather, in Christ, your concerns are my concerns and our concerns should be God's concerns. That shows our reconciliation. It's one way we get on board with God's mission of reconciliation by praying for one another. And from time to time when we hear about relationship problems in the church, which if you've been in the church, you will, you'll hear about problems among fellow members in God's kingdom. You can actually get on board with God's mission and reconciliation by praying for those people. Not by gossiping, not by slandering, not by giving those oh-so-wise personal insights in public settings. These things don't foster the reconciliation that we have. These things work against it, okay? So we take our role of reconciliation seriously when we pray for the kingdom. We pray for God's kingdom with these three pictures in mind. We really are asking God to conquer the broken kingdoms and wills of this world. We're asking that he'd be put in proper place as the true king, and we're asking that he would rule in the hearts and lives of all of us. Okay. We've looked at what the kingdom is. We've considered how to pray for it. Let's briefly close by considering uh, reasons why we pray for it. And I want to suggest four reasons. As followers of Christ, why we must be committed daily to praying for the kingdom. The first one is obvious, because Jesus commands us to pray for it. Okay. As our king, we not only want to follow his example in our lives, but we want to follow his commands in our lives. He knows how life in his kingdom works best. So it's a pretty wise thing to listen. Okay. But beyond this, the mere command, let me suggest three other reasons why a prayer for God's kingdom is necessary in our lives. Firstly, it's a daily reminder that God's kingdom is more important than our own kingdom. It's a daily reminder that God's kingdom is more important than our own kingdom. And our Lord told us to seek first the kingdom of God. And he did so because it's so easy to seek everything else except the Lord and his kingdom. I don't know what you think about what it means to seek first the kingdom of God. I can tell you what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that people then quit their jobs and become full-time ministers. No, in fact, that would be detrimental to the kingdom. God wants ambassadors in all walks of life. As mothers with their children, as carpenters on building sites, as accountants in offices, teachers in classrooms, public servants in councils, doctors, nurses, you name it. You all play an extremely important role in God's kingdom here on earth. But the daily prayer for God's kingdom should make us ask ourselves a few things. As we do these daily roles as ambassadors, we should ask ourselves, whose kingdom am I building? Am I building my kingdom or am I building God's kingdom? Do I do things so I can be noticed or I do things to direct things to the Lord? Daily prayer for God's kingdom should make us reassess how we use our time. Whose kingdom am I investing in with my time? Is it all about me or is it all about him? It should make us consider what we do before we watch or binge watch that big long TV series over a weekend or when we spend those four to five hours a night on video games. Do you consider what God wants before you waste countless hours obsessing about your own personal goals, your looks, your status, your possessions? These are things that each and every one of us struggle with at some point. Okay? But a prayer for God's kingdom daily is a prayer to reflect on these things and ask ourselves, Lord, whose kingdom am I building? Praying for God's kingdom daily reminds us that we don't really work or we don't merely work for a paycheck, but rather we work to honour our king. It reminds us that there's more to life than being entertained. There are souls to be saved and relationships to be nurtured. It reminds us that all we have will fade away and only what is done for Christ will remain. Praying for God's kingdom and his will reminds us that his kingdom is more important than our own. Next, praying for God's kingdom is a way to stay outwardly focused instead of inwardly consumed. Outwardly focused instead of inwardly consumed. We live in a world obsessed with self. And as Christians living in this world, this sickness called selfism can often rub off on us. And we need to guard ourselves against us. And one way we do that is actually keeping our focus on something far greater than ourselves, upon God and his kingdom. And so you'll notice in the Lord's Prayer that the prayer for the coming kingdom is the only will, or the only petition, sorry, the only petition that is completely outward focused. 
And in this way, it follows or it shapes the rest of the prayers that follow. We pray, Lord, your kingdom come and your will be done. And then we ask that you give us what we need. You give us our daily bread, that you would forgive us and that you would lead us. It sits at the start of the Lord's Prayer to remind us that our prayers, all of our prayers, should be directed toward God's good ends. Not our own, God's good ends, because they're far better than you and I can ever think of. It reminds us that in him, we live and we move and we have our being. And lastly, a prayer for God's kingdom and for his kingdom to come keeps our eyes on the end goal. And by doing so, it helps us stay on the good path. Let me explain. If you can think back to the time when you were getting your learner's permit, your driver's permit, or whether you were just starting to ride a bike, you will remember that when you start, it was often hard to keep the bike or the car steady on one smooth track. Your eyes were fixed just in front of you, and you'd find yourself weaving, veering to the left and then veering to the right, and that's because you were just looking just in front of you. And while it's funny to look at it at a distance, it's not really safe, and so it's not good, but still funny. But it happens because our focus is too shallow. And you know this now, if some of you have been driving for many years, when you focus too shallow, you don't really stay in the middle of the road. But when we learn to focus off into the distance, or the part of the road where we were trying to get to, all of a sudden, our driving became steady. It becomes steady and smooth as we go around corners, or even when we go in straight lines. Well, in this sense, this is what happens when we keep our eyes focused on God's kingdom in prayer. We no longer need to veer to the left and the right to dodge what we think are major problems, what we think are major problems, but we consider, when we consider the issues that we face in light of the glory that awaits, it help us to keep things in the right perspective. And there is no greater perspective than God and his good kingdom. Okay? So these are those four reasons why we should continue to pray daily for God's kingdom. And I don't know about you, but for me, these reasons are just as important as my daily need for food and guidance. May our lives continue to reflect a desire for God's coming kingdom in all areas of our life. You know, I just want to wrap up by going back to where I started. I began our sermon uh, with the words of a German pastor named Helmut Thielicke. And amidst the darkness of World War II, he was surrounded by death and despair. The broken kingdoms of this world, that was all they offered him. He sought to encourage his congregation to pray for God's kingdom to come. He wanted to remind them. He wanted to remind them that God and his kingdom, his good kingdom, will put an end to the evil of this world. You know, later in that same sermon, he reflected upon an encounter that he needed to reinforce these truths. See, there was a time when discouragement and Misery crept into his heart in such a way that he felt without hope. It's probably a place that many of us have been before. And he reflects upon this and he writes this. He says, My work in Stuttgart it seemed to have been gone to pieces and my listeners were scattered to the four winds and the churches lay in rubble and ashes. On one occasion when I was so absorbed with these gloomy thoughts, I was looking down into a concrete pit of a cellar which had been shattered by a bomb, killing over 50 people. You know, as he stood there, this woman came up and asked him whether or not he was Pastor Helmet, and she could no longer recognise him because the clothes he wore. He told her who he was, and then she quietly said to him, you know, my husband, he died down there. The clean-up squad was unable to find a trace of him. All that was left was his cap. All that was left was his cap. And you can imagine the news just sank Helmet deeper and deeper into his pit of despair. Questions. Where is the kingdom of God amidst such evil? Why does the good news of the kingdom often feel so far away? Why even bother to pray? And then she continued. We were here last time you preached at the cathedral church. And here before this pit, I want to thank you for preparing him, this is her husband, for preparing him for eternity. My friends, why should we continue to pray for God's kingdom and that his will will be done? Why should we commit ourselves to daily praying that God would rule and reign over all things? Because even at the literal edge of the pit of death, God and his good news of the kingdom are never too far away. They're still at work. Let us remember, our Lord promised a kingdom that would stand the test of time, a kingdom that would come in all its glory, and may we never, ever lose focus of that. And may we continue to pray, your kingdom come and your will be done. Let's pray now. Our good and glorious Father, you are the supreme king over all things. You rule in ways 
which are just and benevolent. And we are just recipients of that grace. We pray that you would help us to keep your kingdom in focus. We pray also that you would help us to continue to pray, not just for our sakes, but for the sakes of those around the world who do not have it as good as us. You know, we look back at World War II and we think of the horrific things then, but we know now that much of your church sits in persecution, in places where they're not able to meet safely. They're harassed, they're terrorised, they're persecuted because they love you. And even though sometimes it can feel like this life isn't that bad, things aren't too bad. For some in this world, things are utterly horrible. And so for our brothers and sisters, we stand and we plead for their case. And we ask that your kingdom would come, that you would put an end to suffering, that you'd put an end to the evil of this world, that you would reign as king over all people. We pray for our hearts. Let us not be deluded into thinking that our ways are better than your ways. But Father, in all things, help us to seek your kingdom and your will in our own lives. Be with us the rest of this day. May we honour you in how we love and care for one another. Until we meet again, Lord, we pray that you protect us. In Christ's name, amen.